she's well up here. Welcome to Chewing the Fat, uh, part of the Fuse Box with our talk session uh, in conjunction with culturebot.org, and we're also uh, live streaming through its new play. Yep, the, yeah. which is uh, through Arena Stage. Through Arena Stage, uh, and today we are going to be having uh, Morgan Thorson from uh, Minneapolis, and in particular, where I, I was just corrected, I, I said you're a choreographer, and you uh, said well, I'm a dance maker. And I was wondering, could you, could you tell us a little bit about the distinction between, uh, that it, you think of? Sure. It's, it's not that, um, you know, intellectual. It's just the, really the word choreographer sounds kind of removed and high art-like. And I like dance maker because it sounds more like I have my hands in it. Yeah. The choreographer sounds removed somehow. Yeah. yeah. And um, so that's why I say dance maker. The kind of work, I like the sound of the work ethic because I, my work, I do very much have my hands in all the areas of the, of the work. It's a ta tangible act. It's a tangible act, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Great. Um, cool. So uh, this is, maybe you're, you've been to Fusebox with Hijack before. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is great. Um, yeah, you've uh, I, can you tell us a little bit just about your background, history, relationship with dance making? Sure. And then maybe also, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the, the, the dance community in Minneapolis as well. Sure. Um, I started making dances late in life. I don't typically think of dancers kind of honing their craft in, in the teen years. And um, I was very ambivalent about the career in art making and dance in particular. Um, but I overcame that in my 30s and started making work. And um, really, once once I got out of New York City, uh, sort of a daunting place to live, um, starting out as a choreographer. And, I, and when I moved to Minneapolis, I, it was a much smaller town, and was able to connect with some like-minded spirits, like Hijack, Arlen, Kristen, um, people who really had a, a back back then we didn't call it a DIY aesthetic, but yeah. who really wanted to. Do art on their terms for people, yeah. and uh, initially I was in a collective with them, and that's exactly what we did. We made art. We, for example, we made a piece that um, we set on a flatbed truck and we drove it around the state of Minnesota, <laughs> and we took it to like corn days in Austin, Minnesota, and to uh, Harvest Day in Blue Earth. And and so, how would you like get the word out, or would you just show up, roll out, and like? Do it was it. before the days of internet, so we there was it was a collective of four people. We split up territories within the state, and we went to the chamber of commerce. And we were like, we want to do a show here. Can we piggyback on a festival or something and like pull our truck up and have this built-in audience? And so that was really one of our first sort of um, forays out into the state, and also uh, one of our big projects to just really experiment with this idea of open permeability permeable display of dance. Would people come out? Yeah, people would come out. We had all kinds of strange and wonderful reactions. <laughs> we went to Grand Marais, which is like a port town in Minnesota. It's kind of a resorty town. It's near the, the entry of the boundary waters. It's, you know, quintessentially cute. And the community really came out and, you know, had food and people with tail. We had a, one of our contingency programs with tail, tailgate parties. Yeah. People would come out and have food and watch us mm. sweat on the truck. And we did in the middle of summer. One of one of our performances was in way west in the state. I can't remember the name of the town, but it was the homecoming um, uh, homecoming football opener. And mm. so uh, we tag teamed on, on the coattails of, of that particular event, which was very strange because mm. here are these women dancing on the truck, and mostly there are, were young young high school football cheerleader types, which I love cheerleaders. Um, and I love football too. I love all sports, but um, I'm just saying it was not, it, it, we were not aesthetically like-minded. Like yeah. But that was the exciting part about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. So now, um, as my work has evolved, I, I still try, I'm really concerned about how, how people are connecting with the work. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm, 
more, um, I'm, I'm curious about the theater as a the display unit for the work and um, trying to um, develop a, an interactive relationship with something that's so sort of re removed for the audience. Um, and that, that sort of takes me into the, my current work, which is about archaeology and visibility and um, showing work in layers of visibility and, and what is it to have, um, what does it mean when you have a partial view or a full view and um, what does it mean when your experience is externalized through movement. Mm. So, um, and so, that, so how much work have you done on this before you arrived in Boston? So Mor Morgan is here as uh, part of a, a residency program. Um, we've done this in different shapes before, so we're trying to sort of formalize it this year. We're starting this series called Machine Shock, and it's basically a series of, of short residencies where we offer artists uh, space, uh, space, time, resources to, to work on something. Um, and it's pretty loose-ended. Uh, but he wasn't sure how much work had been done prior to mm -hmm. arriving. And well, uh, I had a residency last summer, and um, part of that residency was uh, identifying who I was going to work with and working one on one with them. And I generated a lot of material and, and, and just sort of had an intimate conversation about what this piece might be. And through that, um, I, I developed kind of a lot of work, a lot of material. But um, so you were developing that one-on-one -on -one with these people? Yeah, so there are five, six performers, including myself, we've all had a one-on-one -on -one experience, either a couple of weeks in a residency, Max and I made a duet in the fall, um, Hannah and I had a, a in Minneapolis residency together where we developed some material. All of that is in there and has created this sort of history mm. for all of us. I mean, it's through, I'm a conduit, and um, so, one of the strategies for that was just to have uh, this kind of, um, not only horizontal, but kind of vertical feel uh, with movement so we could pull it out from our past mm -hmm. within this um, palette that's been created uh, over time. Um, so we, we, I made a decision before I came here to kind of, to focus, in it, to focus on particular sections that mm -hmm. were kind of percolating. And I was yeah. like, let's, 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 let's try to show something like this, and something like this, and something like this, and see what happens. The other thing that um, wa that is and was um, floating are some other kind of tangential, or not tangential, but important um, design elements that are always sort of nascent to the dance. Like they're, they're equal partners and often I'll think of, oh, I want to do this piece about visibility, but it has to have an upholstered wall. So we're making this upholstered wall. That's part of the, um, the residency um, experience, mm -hmm. not only figuring out how to build that, figuring out is it a static object? Is it interactive? What um, uh, it, dramaturgically is it a is it a creature? Is it um, all these questions? Yeah, yeah. So that's one thing that you really can't do in this rental studio situation. Yeah, yeah. You really need time and space for that. So that's been beautiful. And we have another uh, set piece that we're developing with mirrors, and we'll have a little bit of that. It'll probably be further developed over the years. Uh, before the piece premieres next year. And the piece is going to premiere in France? It is, at Edidance, which is in Belfort, France. It's in, yeah. We got a residency at uh, one of the uh, choreographic centers. They're 19 in France, and we got a residency. I'd like to, to talk a little bit more about this, this uh, sort of building of material with these individuals. Absolutely. So how does that work? Do you have like a directive, or like, uh, what are you using to sort of generate that material? Or Focus it or? Well, um, in this piece, I, I kind of I started really broadly. Mm -hmm. and like I said, there have been a lot of ideas that have come just come to the forefront of my imagination, and I I put them in one big bracket. And I'm like all these things go together, and part of the craft of the work is knowing that sometimes they, on the surface they really appear not to go together. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. With Kristen, for example, we worked with images of reclining nude, so I was really interested in corporality and how how history, physical history, could come through the body, the layers of the body, particularly in the back of the body, which isn't meaning that I want to represent, or, or it's not a piece about fat people, it's just a piece about knowing uh, your own body and what rises through it and what's stored in it. So um, we use this external form of the Finding new, particularly from the 17th century, strung together a lot of material 
that was evoked by our, our um, uh, response to these images. And, um, and then from there, I developed a lot of different kinds of material. Um, it, it was fairly intuitive when I was working with her. And um, we, I always respond to the space I'm in. And uh, it's like this beautiful outdoor, indoor outdoor kind of space in California, and lots of sun and sliding glass doors. So there was a, a very, um, um, I don't know, uh, kind of earthy feel to it. Yeah, so, so anyway, we worked very intuitively. And Karen came out too, and I was with her for a month, and we had a, a different kind of experience. She generated a lot of material um, based on her relationships uh, to some physical forms of sports. And um, so that material was made there, and it's in the piece. It pretty much got made, and it, it's very much still in the shape that it, that it got you know, that it was in California, which I'm really happy about. And she um, performs it in, in a very amazing way. It's very subtle, but um, very clear. Um, uh, what, how else can, have we developed work? I was really curious about discovery for this piece. This like self-discovery when you feel this feeling of, oh, the, I, this is very uh, mysterious, like the whole kind of body-mind centering phenomenon. It's very mysterious think about like something is, an emotional experience is connected to this side of my body. But if you take that leap of faith, which you often have to do with dance, there's lots of sort of mystery and um, faith involved in the, in the work. Um, I forgot where I was going with this. You're talking about discovery? Discovery. So you discover something about yourself that maybe there's something over here on this side of your body coming out. So is this like discovery in real time in the space? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, in, in discovery in terms of research in, in, the, in the room. Also discovery, I, I want that to be met on both sides. So we're using a process of personal discovery in the rehearsal space, but I want the audience to feel like they have enough ability to really observe so that they can make a discovery. Yeah. So I'm, it's kind of sensate discovery. I'm, I'm really interested in that state, sort of surprise and and um, wonder, yeah. um, and and it seems to hook what really well into, or it's, it is inspired by my interest in archaeology, mm. and how you know an, an object can reinvent the present because it tells you about something that happened in the past. So I love that the power of that, and I'm trying to figure out how to to imbue some of the movement with that kind of power through patterning, very simply, you know. You see some, an event that happened on stage and you see it later in a different context and you're like, oh, okay, now I, it, it, it provides hindsight, but it also um, kind of shifts your notion of, of continuity and time. Yeah. So, um, did I answer your question? Yeah, totally. Okay, good. I did have another question, sort of going back, 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 back. Good, back. let's go back. Um, you, know, you were talking about sort of entering the dance world a little bit later. Yeah. But what, what actually sort of sucked you in? Or what pushed you into that? Or, or let me explain. My question is, what interests you about the art form? Well, the, dance and I have had this on-again, off-again relationship since I was a child. And I think part of what happened uh, early on was that I was told that I couldn't dance because of my body type and the size of my body. I've always been an athletic person, very coordinated, and, and very at home moving in a competitive slash cooperative physical situation. Yeah. So I came and went and came and went, and finally I decided that um, it was really a question of contentment in existence. If I was gonna feel like a complete human being, then I had to keep doing it. So it's, it's, it's an occupation of necessity. And that's what I tell people. It's not, I mean, I love it, and it makes me stubborn, and I keep at it. And that's the only reason why I'm still working today is I just haven't given up. I know so many people who, you know, after a while, they're like, this is too hard. I'm going to become a yeah. body worker. And I've certainly thought of those th kinds of things many times as staying in the world of physicality and um, sort of kinesthetic states, but I, um, yeah. so it's a necessity, or it's about, you know, living and communicating, and um, so I'm still doing it. Yeah. Okay.
Can you talk a little bit about your collaboration with Lo? Sure. And how that sure. worked. Her, her, yeah. her last piece, Heaven, uh, is a really wonderful, beautiful piece uh, that toured. Well, you had a killer tour. Yeah, awesome. we had a great tour. Great tour. But she was part of the project was collaborating with this band, Lo. I don't know if you are familiar with Lo, but they're a really awesome band. They're, they're, really, they're really awesome. They're in, kind of indie, underground. They haven't had a lot of pop success. Although Robert Plant just bought the rights to Silver Rider, and he was nominated for an Emmy but did not get it, or whatever the music award is, so they they are like leaning towards some some yeah. some semblance of fame. Um, but they're a Minnesota, you know, icon. People love them. They're they're what you call the slow core genre, which they don't like. But I'm so too lazy to figure out a better way to describe them. <laughs> Uh, some critic wrote that, you know, shortly after one of their successful albums, which means they like to work the edges of the songs. They're they're ironic. Um, they they kind of skirt rock and roll um, stereotypes. Although every now and then, Alan, who's the lead singer, the main songwriter, will you know go out with his boy band and rock yeah. it with retribution gospel choir. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So awesome. yeah. So. Um, Working with them was really interesting. They, interesting. they haven't collaborated with dance since yeah, before, I and um, I was really interested in them because of their vocal work. Yeah. They're, they have a lot of harmonics, and um, Min is just an amazing singer, and Alan is too, and, and so they work, again, with this sort of light touch, or what I call working on the edges, with um, these to vocal tones that kind of come in out of nowhere and then disappear. So they generated um, a, a, basically a sustained drone for like 30 minutes, which they would generate live in the show with microphones and some pre-recorded loops. And they would just, there was a sense of building up and layering of um, um, oral material. And it was a very, it was a, it was a piece that was very much about space. So um, it seemed that, um, again, we were up like aesthetic minds and um, it was a good fit in terms of what he's interested in and she's interested in making their uh, music and what I was interested in with that particular piece. And really, uh, for me, it was a process of emptying out, again, like really wanting the audience to see what was going on, um, perhaps to the point where nothing was going on, um, where the images were nearly static uh, for prolonged periods of time. And that has some problems. You know, some people want to be inundated with um, information and images and impulses. And I um, intentionally decided that I wanted to empty out and really make things simple. And to, in, that, in, the, in that extreme restraint, find freedom. And I think Alan works that way too. Um, also, Alan's a religious man, and so it appealed to him, or he has religion, but appealed to him in his own um, relationship with deity, whatever that is. I, um, and, you know, Heaven was questioning that. Mostly from my vantage point, it was about um, why do we need churches to tell us what to do? Uh, can I not generate my own value system? That was one. I mean, there's many inquiries, but that was one of many inquiries for me. Um, so, um, but the, the collaboration was wonderful. And, um, yeah, so how did that play out? Like, were they responding to pieces of series of movements, or was it vice versa, or both? They, they or? responded a, a great deal to the, to the movement. Mm -hmm. Initially, when I went up to Duluth to talk to them, I showed them the first chunk that, I, again, that I, I knew we were going to do this, which is a walking processional, and was it going to be a processional that allowed the audience to really see the, the dancers, and it was a very obvious metaphor of many religious practices, many religious practices use walking as a, uh, a conduit to you know, enlightened spiritual states. And um, it was my way of actually delineating and giving thanks to space. Because I feel like as the more I work, the more I'm working with this intangible tangible, which is space. And how can I give materiality to something that is so um, immaterial? Yeah. So that, to me, is my, that's kind of what Space Holder Festival is about. Okay. Even though it's much more, um, I feel like there's a, many more anchor, uh, yeah, yeah. many more narrative anchors in this piece than in Heaven, which was very, very dry. Um, I'm still, I'm still loving how does dance give agency to, to space and how can we, instead of focusing on the body, yeah. let's focus on what's right around the body. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Alan was really into that, and also Alan is very physical, so he was really drawn to the whole process of, of, of 
you know, creating, shaping, and, and moving. Yeah. And if we had, that was wonderful. Yeah, when, in one of our beginning rehearsals, we just did a lot of kind of um, scores about losing inhibition and um, being possessed by states that would arise. And they jumped in. I think they also work very intuitively. They do respond to, they did do a lot of responding. Um, I'm hoping that Alan's going to make the music for this next piece. Sure. Yeah, we're in conversation and it will be more, um, I think it'll, it won't be so much responding as, I, as me saying, okay, here are the ideas. Yeah. Can, you, can you go away and compose and then let's see how they align and then I want to respond to the music that he makes from Wonderful. his ideas. Yeah. So that's, I'm hoping it will be an ongoing relationship. Um, and, and can you talk about any other sort of uh, either influences or other artists that you're especially inspired by right now or interested in? Or? Yes. Um, I, I just want to preface that by saying that I've been thinking about originality in contemporary dance, sort of referential, ref, being deferential, referential originality, and how origina the quest of originality has really brought the form down in a lot of ways. <laughs> Um, Can you uh, elaborate on that? Yeah. Well, what I, especially in more abstract work, but there, this tendency to want to innovate movement, um, in my opinion, uh, leads to over-generating material and then you can't see or feel what's going on. And so my response early on with Baker, for example, was to frame events with um, a structure of metaphor, but not with, uh, or, or a structure of narrative, but without giving all the details so that there were, and it's not an original approach, but right. um, just so there was some framing. Yeah. So that turned, not only gave dramaturgical order to the dancers, because often, you know, in, in abstract dance, we are forms, which I, like Cunningham, I love, but Cunningham is, is, um, is another kind of genius that some of these contemporary choreographers, I think, probably want to be, but are not, are not quite there. So, so I love the conundrum of, I don't have to be original, but how can I frame this? So um, I don't have to make up really cool steps, but how can I frame this to um, draw people in and we really want to connect or um, respond? You know, that maybe they, maybe they reject it. Um, so wait, what was your question initially? I, I went on a tangent. You were talking about uh, influences, influences or just people that you're interested in? Well, um, I would definitely say, uh, this is almost cliche at this point, John Cage. No, um, no Still hugely relevant. Yeah, hugely relevant. Yeah, hugely, hugely relevant. Totally. One of my favorite books is The Year from Monday. I mm -hmm. look at it often, and I love the way how he says to remain in the state of not knowing, and I think about that a lot in this work. It's, yeah. it, it feels very weird, um, and sometimes completely um, irresponsible, <laughs> but um, I really try to um, live with that. As, and, and the upholstered wall is a good example of that because I felt it, it you know, is an image in my mind, and I, I still feel really committed to it. But I had no idea how to make it, what it would mean, and um, how it would influence the theater, what problems it would, it would, it would create, and what and what opportunities it would create. I just had the sense that it had to be built. And um, so I, I feel like I've done that a lot in my work and I've had a lot of success working that way. Um, it's more intuitive. Um, but uh, I would have to say recently I saw a piece by Sarah Mitchison called Devotion, which was her sort of piece about being a creator. I, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that. Um, I actually never asked her specifically <laughs> and um, what it was about. And I, I doubt that she would even sit, describe it that way. Right, right. But um, it was so interesting, having done Heaven, to look at a work that was about reverence in dance. Mm -hmm. And I know she's very, very reverent um, to many dance makers. Mm -hmm. Another recent um, inspiration has been Lucinda Childs, who worked with uh, Philip Glass. Her first collaboration with the composer was Philip Glass. She was actually in Einstein on the Beach, and oh, wow. that's where she met Philip Glass. And they just did a remount of a 1979 piece called The Dance. I don't even know. Like, it, look, look on the Walker website, because it was just there. Or something like dancing, something really plain and just straight ahead, this is what it is. 
And she scored the whole thing um, with a sort of map. Um, and you know, Phil, apparently the story is that Phil Glass saw the map and was like, oh, I totally understand how you've interpreted this. This is fantastic. I, let's go. Oh, and Saul DeWitt um, made films uh, of, of the dancers. And so it was very controversial because the Saul DeWitt films are projected simultaneously with the dance. And so the, the images of the dancers in the film are huge and the real dancers are little. And it was really controversial when it came out in 79, people walked out. So now it's, it's, a, it's a piece that celebrates, again, essentialism, which is kind of where I'm at. Even though, again, I think my work does have more narrative anchoring. Um, I'm so into this idea of stripping down, what is this move, where does it come from? Um, I have a lot of ballet training that now, as I get older, and actually my alignment is getting better because I work on my body regularly. Not that I take class, but I do Pilates, and I do yoga, and I, I've just engaged with my body more than I've ever have been. The ballet is coming out of my body. It's coming out. And I don't know if it's because it makes sense now that my body's really aligned. Um, I, early on, I worked hard to refuse it. To um, When you say it's coming out, it's like being? Um, you can see it in my body, okay. Okay. in my stature. Okay in the choices I'm making, making it in the, um, what we call equipment, the way the shoulder and the head, um, you know, you get this, these angles drilled into you as a ballerina. And um, so it comes out of my choreography. And I, instead of pushing that away, I'm using that reference or derivation to give my work some tone that um, I'm finding very interesting. Again, and I'm also chopping things off, like in ballet you would do these, these funny hop preparations before you do a grand entrance, and we're just doing the pop, pop preparation. Like I'm making a, a, a string of material out of something that would never just be <laughs> isolated and framed alone right. in ballet. So um, again, I, it goes back to originality. I, I don't think that my moves are that original, but I think, again, it's a way that I'm trying to see them and structure them that is bringing a perspective that I find interesting yeah. to, the, yeah. to the form. And um, I, I of course, I want other people to find it interesting too. I, I also want to give room for ideas in my work. You know, it's not just about having an un, a mysterious experience, but like, oh, she's working with something specific. We can talk about it and, and have an intellectual experience with it, aside from kinesthetic, all that gar jargon that we talk about um, in live performance, which always sounds really boring to me to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but it's important. Let's face it. Oh, hold on. Starbucks coffee. Oh. I mean, uh, use box coffee. Yeah, use box. <laughs> um, so, yeah, yeah those are good. a lot of influences. Yeah, that's great. I'm influenced by my partner, Karen Sherman. Yeah, she's, she's wonderful. A, she's, she's a she's movement genius. She has a theater background, was never a trained dancer the way I was. And when we're problem solving in rehearsal, she'll often just go, I think what you should do is, you know, bring it around this corner and take it out here. And I'm like, oh my God. So this whole notion that you're kind of spacified as a dancer and, and your composition is coming up through you as you live on the stage is so true. And her instincts are quite refined and come from a totally different world. So my collaborators, collaborators have a huge influence. Um, other people, Chris, working with Kristen also, her sensibility, yeah. her aesthetic is yeah. different than mine, but um, her sensibility on stage, her knowledge of body and timing Really, really That's important. Kristen Van Loon. Kristen Van Loon, yeah. Okay. Yep. yeah. And others. Uh, Max Worsing has been helping me develop the visual design for the show. Mm -hmm. He's been he's a visual artist and dance maker and just like a fabulous smart man. And he's been he's been he and I have been talking at length about the, not only the concept of the work but the all the, the, the design elements coming together. Perfect hopefully for this showing, but in the future. We're really using this as a stepping stone to let it, you know, make some mistakes, let ideas fall down, who knows? Be, be let it be mysterious, and not know. Yeah, love it. Yeah, it's been really fun. It's a great bit. We've had a blast. It's been a lot of work, but it's been fun. Yeah, I was talking with uh, Phil Sultanoff, who's one of our other artists the other day, about, uh, he's a big proponent of uselessness. Mm. Um, in fact, he had this whole sort of like I love manifesto it. about uselessness, uh, mm. especially in, in making of work. And I just really think that that's 
helpful or a nice idea. It's um, great. You know? Yeah. Because it, it allows you to ask some very different sorts of questions mm -hmm. and explore some things in a very different way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Instead of, and I think it speaks to some sense this, this idea that you're talking about of, of originality and this, this desire to like be original mm -hmm. um, and do something mm -hmm. unique. And, mm -hmm. and like it, it starts to kind of him you win, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, one instead of, our, of just asking a, a simple, sort of naive question in the space, you know? Yeah, absolutely. One of the processes that we've been doing um, is I'll do some movement, and then the dancers, I'll say, okay, what's the essence of this? And they'll do it. No, 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 I'll say, you decide what the essence is, and then take everything extra, everything that's not useful, mm. and make that. Yeah, totally. The phrase, so go yeah. away and string those things together. Yeah. And it's bizarre and really fun. Yeah. So we have we call them baskets, okay? So we give one basket of non not useful moves from this from this day, and then you have another basket. And I often develop my work like here's this area, this area, this area, and then mm. I try to figure out uh, mm. sort of core logic to bring them together. But it's been really fun. Wonderful. And it's been quite broad. I mean, we've been all over the place with this sure. piece, so I, that's why I didn't want to bring too much forward. Otherwise, it could be a kind of diluted situation. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone have any questions? I feel, I feel solid about that. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> this is too bad. You covered a lot of ground. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's a good interview with my shut up. You know, is it? it? Yeah, it okay. is. If I'm not talking, let's get out. This is. Okay. You can do this all after your long. This is great. You can slowly go from pancakes to liquor. I'm very happy with it. Uh, that's great. Great. Thank you. Well, thanks, it's really yeah. good to meet you, and thanks for asking. Totally, questions. of course. No, and uh, thrilled about seeing seeing what you guys are playing around with. Yeah, it's going to be fun. South Carolina Garden. Mm -hmm. Starting tomorrow. Night. Tomorrow night we're doing a showing at seven. There's one on Saturday at seven, and one on Sunday at two. Two. And um, I might say that we do have a little bit of sound, and a lot of that was generated and pieced together by Karen also. So I uh, just want to give, give credit where credit is due. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.